Minoan civilization was so advanced that these ladies had flush toilets in their homes. There's some evidence of batteries, electroplated jewelry, glass lenses. It's their painting skills that interest us here, but overall, theirs was a very high degree of technology and the destruction of their island almost certainly led to the legend of Atlantis. So you can call these Atlanteans if you want to, and I won't argue with you. Here's another one over here. This one shows a lady who has stubbed her toe and she's sitting on a volcanic rock. She has one hand up to her forehead in a gesture of pain. And with her other hand, she's massaging her bleeding foot, which no doubt taught her a lesson about walking around barefoot on volcanic rocks. You have to wonder just what the situation was that the artist was recording here. Painters during this time period were still having trouble with perspective and three-dimensional modeling, which is why for all their beauty, these paintings are a bit flat and cartoonish. At roughly the same time period in Egypt, art was also making strides. This is a tomb painting, the tomb of Noct, 18th dynasty. You can see here they had a pretty good degree of realism by then. The tomb art of the time was rather stylized and rigid, but these three musician girls are still rather naturally represented. Realistic painting made great strides under the ancient Greeks. They are the ones who first really could depict the human form in a very natural and realistic manner. And that carried right on into the Roman period. This is a Roman painting from Pompeii, but it was almost surely painted by a Greek. This is one of a series of paintings found on the walls of a Roman home which is now called the Villa of the Mysteries. This girl here on the left is being whipped, apparently as part of an initiation into a woman's cult. Here is another Roman one from Pompeii, showing a girl with her pen and writing pad. This is how she looked on the wall in Pompeii, and in my restoration, I tried to bring her back close to her original appearance. After the fall of Rome, realist painting was almost lost. The skills nearly disappeared, but it revived again after the Renaissance with painters like Da Vinci and here's Rembrandt's waiting woman. Here's one of Vermeer's that I replicated. His girl with a pearl earring even had a movie made about her recently. I think realist art reached its height after all those thousands of years in the 19th century. Here I copied one of Adolphe Bouguereau's little girls. And then, of course, we had the wonderful portrait painters of that time, such as John Sargent. Here is his lady, Agnew of Lochnaw. I call her Gertie. And then art declined once again during the 20th century when we had two terrible world wars and other social upheavals that did a lot of damage to art as well as everything else. But throughout that perhaps 20,000 year span of the development of Western art, as I replicated these paintings, I began to see certain painting techniques that recurred time and time again over the centuries and that worked very well to depict the human form realistically. For example, the beautiful Fayum portraits that were buried with mummies in Egypt and which were painted nearly 2,000 years ago have much in common with the best portraits of 100 years ago, or of today for that matter. In fact, the painting techniques are practically identical, and I'm putting them into practice myself. For example, in this small portrait I did of a little girl who lives next door. At the conclusion of my art history project, I began experimenting with original paintings and trying some of these techniques that I had picked up in replicating these examples of ancient art. And it turned out they work quite as well today as they did at any time in the past. You've already seen it actually in that picture of Pandora that I painted over there and the paintings that this video began with and there's more at the end. And lately I've been recreating other classical and mythological themes in oil paint such as Ariadne here. I'm sure you remember the legend of Ariadne and her sword and her ball of string. Well here she is. And the costume she's wearing is absolutely authentic because the legend of Ariadne dates back to Minoan times, and therefore she would have worn the clothing that I showed you on these ancient Minoan paintings earlier. So I made a costume copied from these ancient paintings, authentic right down to the jewelry, and dressed my model in it. In addition to mythological subjects like Ariadne and Pandora, I've been painting traditional themes lately. 
I'm lucky to have a beautiful daughter to paint and she likes to wear old time clothing. In this one, she was supposed to pose reading the book, but she got bored and fell asleep. So I just painted her this way. Go with the flow, right? And it probably came out better this way. So that's the Tom Baker quick tour of painting history. Not the Doctor Who time traveler that I'm often confused with. Maybe I could be Doctor Whom. Him from whom you learn painting history. Anyway, ever since I put up an art website to go along with my archaeology website, I've been receiving queries from other oil painters and especially from student painters wanting to know such things as how do you achieve these realistic three-dimensional effects with paint on two-dimensional surfaces like canvas? How do you, for example, mix good skin colors? And once you've mixed your skin colors, how do you represent such things as the shaded side of the face as opposed to the lit side of a face? Things like that. So it's to answer questions like that without having to write too many more emails because it's cutting into my time to paint. It's to answer questions like that that I'm doing this video how-to series and I'll be able to provide a lot more information besides than I could in emails. It is heartening to me though as a historian to see this interest in traditional painting because we had such a long dry spell there in the 20th century when realistic painting almost went the way of the dodo bird. The skills were almost lost. For a long time there was a rejection of realistic imagery and sound painting principles and there was even a cynical celebration of ugliness. I saw this horrible thing recently in the Art Institute of Chicago. Anyway, it would be a tragedy to let the ancient traditions of realist painting die now after so many thousands of years of development. And to those who say we don't need it anymore because now we have photography, I say that anyone who has compared photographs with paintings knows that photography could never replace or even equal the creative possibilities and expressive power of painting even with digital manipulation of photographs. Not to mention the fact that the colors in photographs eventually fade away, whereas oil paint holds its colors practically forever, for thousands of years, which could be unfortunate in some cases. Nor can colored photographic dyes come anywhere near the beauty and richness of oil paint. And the techniques of using that beautiful paint to create classic realist art will be the subject of my upcoming tutorial videos. But we'll leave the topic of painting techniques to another DVD. This one is about the stretching of canvas. Because if you're going to paint, you have to paint on something, and nowadays it's almost always on canvas. In fact, in the minds of the general public, canvas and oil paint are so tightly linked together that a lot of people don't think an oil painting is legitimate unless it's on canvas. And that's despite the fact that in the past, and even today, there are better things to paint on than canvas. Wood panels for one thing. How many people know that the Mona Lisa by Da Vinci is painted on a wooden panel? And that many of Rembrandt's paintings are on wood 